Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, this is uh, the fourth day of our webinar, as you all know. And uh, so far, um, really great participation from everybody. Uh, I think uh, this is going to be um, kind of an extension of the discussion we started yesterday. It's going to be presented by Dr. Mola. Uh, the uh, the uh, title is Acute Respiratory Failure in Patients with COVID-19, as you can see. Dr. Mola, he is a graduate of uh, Duma University. Uh, he is um, um, uh, boarded both in internal medicine as well as uh, critical care and pulmonary medicine. He did uh, both the internal medicine and uh, the critical care training here in Wisconsin. And, uh, and then he left us despite uh, a heavy recruitment from our university to keep him here. So he's someone with uh, uh, a lot of uh, humility and uh, someone who has a, a good understanding of the subject matter. And I think some of you know him from his visits in Addis uh, that uh, he has been uh, with you at the Black Line Hospital spending some uh, volunteer time. So without any further delay, uh, let's listen to Dr. Mola. So Mola, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gramata for your uh, generous introduction. Uh, I, without taking much time, I will go straight into my <clears throat> talk. I really want to make this kind of back and forth discussion. Um, most of the things I'm talking about today have been, I think, somehow talked about the last few presentations and my I would like to be a little more practical and I would like to spend some more time with the experience I had so far. Um, so <clears throat> I'm a, a critical care and pulmonary physician so I would like to focus into the management of patients uh, coming to the hospital who are very uh, I mean seriously ill. Uh, so <clears throat> let me make this bigger. Can you see this better? Yes, yes. So how do these patients, uh, once as it's been talked in the last few days, the patients affected with COVID-19 infection, uh, <clears throat> uh, some of them remain asymptomatic. Uh, majority of patients uh, the, who develop symptoms do not require hospitalization. Uh, when we look into the uh, data that came out of China and that was published in New England Journal of Medicine uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, majority of patients uh, who are presenting to the hospitals uh, present with cough uh, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, the most prominent symptom is fever. And they just have uh, generalized fatigue, uh, myalgias, arthralgias, uh, and uh, obviously uh, they start coming to the hospital when they start to feel dyspneic. Uh, GI symptoms are uh, common, uh, not uncommon. Uh, I have seen it, uh, uh, some of patients presenting to us with really profound GI symptoms as well. Um, <clears throat> this is you know, presenting symptom for patients in the hospital. But when uh, we look at how this disease progresses, uh, I have attended a session that was uh, uh, done by Emory University and we gathered some local data in here. So they kind of classify the patients presenting symptoms into four phases. It is nothing, you know, final. Everything is uh, developing as as time goes. We are understanding more and more about this disease. So most patients start with a form of prodrome uh, in the uh, hospital in the pre-hospitalization area. As I said earlier, it starts with some non-specific viral symptoms, some sore throat, uh, dry cough, uh, myalgias, arthralgias. And then patients start to have, you know, poor appetite and nausea and vomiting as well. Uh, as the disease progresses, <clears throat> uh, it's not kind of rapid uh, developing pneumonia that usually uh, you see with uh, bacterial pneumonia. In most patients, it's a slow smoldering disease. Um, and patients generally seem to be okay when you just look at them, but they tend to be hypoxemic. And quite tend to have quite significant uh, radiographic findings. Uh, usually after admission, uh, they require about two, ten, two to 10 liters of oxygen. As I said earlier, they 
seem comfortable, but they require quite a bit of oxygen. They start to be tachypneic um, in an imaging of normites, as I said earlier. Uh, as time goes, they start to have some difficulty mobilizing these secretions. Uh, and uh, perhaps a deterring factor is that these patients, when they get admitted to the hospital, there is a tendency to uh, over resuscitate them. You know, they're labeled as having sepsis and they give three, four, they get three, four liters of fluid and they're already volume up when they, when they come to ICU when patients get sicker. So these are the, uh, one of the, you know, characteristic imaging findings from one of my patients, but most patients tend to have these areas of geographic areas of uh, ground glass opacity, as you see on the uh, CT scan in here, radiography as well. You see a right upper lobe uh, uh, opacity a little bit in the right middle lobe, right lower lobe region and smudge in the left side as well. Uh, <clears throat> then they, tend to get slowly worse uh, with increasing oxygen requirements. Uh, they start to struggle with having effective cough and are not able to mobilize secretions. Uh, obviously they get more anxious and, uh, uh, and feel short of breath. And that's when, uh, when they, come, they come to us with radiography also progressively uh, worsening. Then, uh, in a normal world, these patients would, would require a uh, higher level of support with high flow uh, nasal cannula uh, or non-invasive uh, support, uh, which uh, can be uh, in this situation not a good idea because we always talk about aerosolization, uh, especially putting these patients on positive pressure ventilation like BiPAP can, be, um, can, uh, can uh, disseminate the infection to healthcare providers and other patients potentially. Um, uh, I will come to that a little bit later. Then they end up in being intubated. Uh, they seem to have good compliance initially, especially the radiators are coming out of China. That's not necessarily true what we are seeing right now. Uh, we are struggling with uh, poor lung compliance, inability to oxygenate and ventilate, uh, even with higher uh, PIP settings. Uh, initially, in most patients, it starts as respiratory failure. Uh, and you tend to see other mild derangements in other systems uh, like elevated liver enzymes, uh, elevated cardiac markers. They tend to have uh, a little bit of hypotension as well. Even though in most situations, uh, there is no vasodilatory shock as we see in septic shock patients usually. Uh, <clears throat> and the, you may see a leukopenia and lymphopenia, which is not you know, very uh, universal, but you may see this in some patients. Uh, they continue to have intermittent fevers. Shall I proceed? Good. Yes. And then uh, in the last four, these patients tend to decline rapidly, uh, progressively to death, or require a tremendous amount of life support uh, for several days. Or uh, most patients tend to have a, a steady and slow uh, progression to recovery. So. It's, it's postulated that this rapid progression to multi-organ failure in this uh, may be related to high inflammatory uh, uh, phase, uh, or they call it cytokine storm. Uh, patients tend to have, some patients tend to have fulminant viral myocarditis and they suddenly become hemodynamically unstable, go into malignant arrhythmias and, and, and death. And we see quite a number of patients even uh, in, in the area that I work here patients tend to go into rapid, uh, I mean, progressive renal failure, liver numbers going higher, uh, and these kind of patients uh, will require renal replacement therapy for volume removal. So in the data that came uh, from uh, China, you know, one of the data that I came across, uh, they say average vent days was 5.2, but in most other uh, studies, it's actually longer, uh, generally about 10 days uh, on the ventilator. So as it was uh, discussed the other day, uh, most critical time, especially in terms of exposure to healthcare providers is uh, airway management. So uh, if possible, uh, before proceeding to intubation, it would be best to place these patients in negative pressure room. Uh, 
And it's very, very, very vital to use appropriate uh, PPE in this kind of patients because intubation can potentially aerosolize uh, viruses and uh, increase higher risk for healthcare uh, providers. Again, in these patients, uh, <clears throat> try to avoid, as I said, uh, aerosolizing procedures, which uh, would include uh, non-invasive ventilation. Even high flow nasal cannula can uh, lead into some degree of aerosolization. Avoid nebulizer therapy and then change those kind of medicine into mated dose inhalers. Uh, try to avoid bronchoscopy, GI procedures, and the like. So it's recommended to do early intubation. Uh, what we're doing right now is when the patient's hypoxemia progresses and gets into eight, you know, 10 liters in that range, even if they seem comfortable, we, uh, we do uh, early intubation without putting on a non-invasive ventilation or, or high flow, even high flow nasal cannula if possible so that they still have some reserve and you can uh, do what we call a rapid sequence intubation. Uh, what that means is we just you know, induce patients and paralyze them uh, so that they don't cough, uh, avoid suctioning during intubation. So intubation should be done, the most available expertise in Ethiopian context, uh, given the limited number of critical care physicians, as far as I, I know and understand. I think it may be necessary to, uh, to mobilize anesthesia team in these hospitals to manage the airways uh, so that you know the intubation can be done in the first shot yeah, trying to section around trying to bug patients and try to put them you know to get the oxygen higher if the first intubation was not successful uh, can can lead into significant aerosolization and uh, significant risk for for the health care state when you do intubate, um, uh, try to avoid a uh, number of staff. Uh, when patients get sicker, there is a tendency that people will influx into that room. What we are doing right now is uh, I would be the only uh, physician in the room. I will have one respiratory therapist and I will have only one nurse, just three of us in the room to minimize uh, risk to staff. Uh, and if these kind of patients decline, uh, please do not rush into those rooms, the priority should be protecting healthcare professionals. So make sure that you don't appropriate PPE before rushing into these, these patients. Uh, and as I said, uh, rapid sequence intubation, avoid bagging. Uh, and after intubation, sometimes, you know, there may be glitches in the ventilator circuit and stuff like that. Try to avoid uh, uh, circuit breaks, try to avoid disconnecting the ventilator because when that happens, uh, right after intubation, they tend to cough and then it, it can be a massive aerosolization of uh, viruses into, into the room and risk to stop. So after intubation, this, how do we ma manage these patients? Management of these patients who are developing ERDS and requiring mechanical ventilatory support at this time is not much different from the routine management of ERDS patients. Um, we uh, employ low tidal volume uh, ventilation strategy because um, uh, that's how uh, that's what saves lives based on um, based on the ARDS net, pro net protocol and use higher level of pressure uh, to try to recruit more alveoli and avoid shear injury when the alveoli close and open. Uh, patients who are quite hypoxemic, uh, may need deep sedation and uh, chemical paralysis uh, to for ventilator synchrony. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, try to avoid uh, over resuscitation. Uh, these patients, we know that these patients would benefit from uh, uh, diuresis and try to keep them on the dry side. We say the lungs are happier when they are drier. And then the other thing that we do for ARDS patients is prone positioning. And, and in my unit, we have about 19 intubated patients currently, and six of them are in prone position, and it, it, it helps oxygenation quite tremendously. If hypoxemia gets worse, we may use pulmonary uh, vas vasodilators like uh, uh, <coughs> nitric inhaled nitric oxide and, uh, and uh, apoprestinol, uh, but these are you know, not proven to to affect outcome and, and my understanding is that these medications are not available in Ethiopia. Now the last question is what happens when if despite all of this oxygenation gets worse there's a question of extra corporeal life support even in the advanced settings including ours. 
um, uh, we tend to, uh, the capacity is very limited. I don't think uh, even major hospital systems can support, uh, can, uh, can use this kind of support for more than in three, four patients. And, and, uh, and this is not even a question in Ethiopia, in the Ethiopian context, because the availability is very limited even in the Western world. Other adjunctive treatments, as I said earlier, if renal function and electrolytes and blood pressure allows you just, you know, avoid, uh, there is a notion that when patients are admitted that everyone gets maintenance fluid, so that's not necessary unless, unless the patient's hypotensive or in acute renal failure, you may give them fluid boluses, but avoid continuous fluid infusions and try to diurese them as much as you can. Uh, <clears throat> also, always, you know, the fact that one some patient, patients have COVID-19 does not exclude other infections. Always actively look and treat for concomitant infections. We tend to put all these patients on a broad spectrum antibiotic coverage until cultures return initial. Uh, again, avoid aerosolizing procedures that we talked about earlier. Um, optimize electrolyte management. Uh, monitor input and outputs. Um, when patients become hemodynamic unstable, obviously they may need uh, vasopressor support. Uh, provide nutrition as early as possible. Uh, I know Dr. Elias uh, talked about drug therapy, and I would like to share my experience briefly in here. As you know, antiviral therapies, this uh, Caledra company, uh, the uh, uh, HIV medicine is not proven to be uh, even in a small number of patients that they tried useful, so we're not using it. We are almost routinely using hydroxychloroquine. <clears throat> Just be mindful that it can lead into QT prolongation in arrhythmias and can lead into cardiac death, in patient, in, uh, especially in patients who are manifesting you know, viral myocarditis. Uh, this nucleoside analog, remdesivir, uh, is shown to be uh, promising, at least in the, in the experimental stage, but it's not even widely available in here. IL-6 therapy, same thing. Uh, we are using it for limited number of patients. I've given it to three patients so far and have seen good outcome. Uh, on two patients, again, it's a very, very limited data. Actually, one of the patients I just extubated yesterday. So if it becomes available, uh, it might be uh, something promising. Steroids can be uh, harmful. And the other thing is that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, drugs, there's a data that came out of Germany that uh, these are potentially harmful, so probably avoid ibuprofen and other non-steroidals. Uh, aspirin, I mean uh, acetaminophen, uh, I think it's called Panadol in Ethiopia, uh, it's a brand is Tylenol in here, can be used cautiously, especially in patients who don't have uh, fulminant liver failure. So prognosis, as I said, most patients have mild symptoms and don't need hospitalization, only about 15 to 20 percent uh, uh, need hospitalization and about only 5% of them need ICU admission and mechanical ventilation. Uh, again, it tends to be smoldering progressive disease uh, with median uh, uh, symptom base of about nine to 10 days to ICU admission. Uh, everyone can be affected. I have uh, so many patients uh, in 40s, uh, 30s that are on you know, massive amount of life support but obviously mortality and decline uh, in condition is more prominent in elderly people and in patients with comorbid issues. Uh, but interestingly, for something that's not very well understood yet, the children zero to 14 years uh, seem to be affected very, very rarely, and only there are only uh, sporadic reports about infection in those age groups. Worse outcomes, again, increasing age, uh, comorbid issues, uh, <clears throat> higher SOFA score uh, uh, at presentation, patients uh, with elevated D-dimer, high uh, inflammatory markers like ferritin and CRP and elevated troponin tend to offer outcomes based on the study that came out of China. Uh, this was a study that was just published in JAMA uh, yesterday. This is by far the largest, they looked at the largest uh, uh, number of patients, about 1,600 patients. Um, uh, <clears throat> from Italy, obviously uh, the mortality that they're reporting, uh, these are like all ICU admissions, about 1,600 patients admitted to ICU. They're still following its preliminary data. 
from those patients uh, who were admitted, about 26% of them died in ICU. Uh, generally, in the mortality is in, a, in the range of 40% in patients who are requiring mechanical ventilation. 16% uh, of these patients are uh, were discharged from ICU, but also keep in mind that most of these patients are still in follow-up in an ICU, and I assume mortality will approach the general range of that, you know, 40%. Some final uh, points. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, this is a very, uh, especially in patients who are sick and admitted to ICU, their mortality is high. Uh, and, 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 and people who work in the ICU settings, uh, staff and uh, visitor priority is, is should be priority. Always make sure that uh, you wear appropriate uh, PPEs. Uh, in the hospitals that we work in here, uh, no visitor is allowed to come to the hospital, even in um, uh, at, at the last you know minutes of the patient's life. So, and, you know, thinking about the Ethiopian context where a lot of people flock into the hospitals when someone is sick, that can be a challenge, but I think this should be ad advocated uh, sooner uh, to try to meet that and to try to uh, limit transmission of disease. Uh, void aerosolizing procedures, always advocate for early intubation, uh, usual care for respiratory failure, it's mostly supportive care. Um, those medicine medications that we talked about are not available in Ethiopia except chloroquine. Uh, now there is the issue of what what if these patients decline and go into cardiac arrest? Should we resuscitate them because cardiopulmonary resuscitation is a very risky procedure? So there has been expert discussions here at national level and also hospital level to uh, not resuscitate these patients when they die because it's number one the chance of getting them around is very low. Number two, it's significant risk, but it's a significant ethical consideration. In the Ethiopian context, I think we should think about this and uh, and probably not, uh, my recommendation would be not to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation when these patients are, are dying. Uh, the other thing is things that need to be planned in the institutional level. I understand that Dr. Uh, Daoud Siraj will talk about this in detail. Uh, there should be a massive preparation uh, for influx, influx of patients, I think it's inevitable. Uh, and it's also important to think and plan about triaging patients uh, in, in the hospital that I work. Uh, they converted uh, 46 bed units into negative pressure isolation in a matter of one week. Even then, we have only three or four beds left. So even with, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the setting that I work in, in the Western setting, it's very uh, becoming very overwhelming. And the resource allocation, uh, you know, patients who are very sick and coming from nursing home, for example, multiple comorbid issues, in shock already, we tend not to admit those kind of patients to ICU. So there should be a plan at local level uh, about uh, uh, using resources for patients who can potentially benefit from this. Um, there is no general rule, but there should be there should be a discussion and planning ahead how to use our limited resources when it comes to uh, when, the, when the surge happens. That's what I have for now. I'm, uh, 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 I will stop talking in here and, and probably start for questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mola, for this uh, really very precise, concise, and clear presentation. Thank you also for giving more time for discussions because I think we all learn a little bit more by discussing this important topic. And, and so before I move into questions, I'd like to see if Dr. Teodros, uh, you know, has uh, any additional thoughts uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Addis. And also if Dr. Dowd has anything to add to this. And, uh, um, and then we can go on the questions. Dr. Teodros, anything to add from your side? How about you, Dowd? Are you there? Yes, I'm here and uh, nothing to add really. Uh, I'm sure many of them are going to come in question and answer, so I will uh, hold my thoughts. Okay. Perfect. So let's start uh, with the question. So I think the first one uh, came from uh, Dr. David Cabrera, who, who says, hey, Mola, do you know we don't have any negative pressure rooms? What alternatives do you have in Addis? What do you think they should do? Yes. Uh... 
I, I know how this, I have seen how the setting looks, uh, the critical setting looks like in, in the Black Lion Hospital and it's, there are not even um, separate rooms. So that's, that's a little bit of, uh, you know, troubling uh, because, <clears throat> Uh, because uh, what I was thinking is when these patients are sick and coming to ICU, the minimum we should try to do is put them in a separate room if possible. Maybe, you know, try to divert other group of patients uh, to, to other institutions and dedicate some of the floors to, to the kind of patients. And at least if, if, if separate rooms cannot be arranged for this kind of patients, at least, you know, keep the distance between patients as much as possible. You know, the general recommendation at community level is two meters or six feet. Uh, but the way the beds were positioned there, um, uh, they are you know, close to one another. So that's something that can be done, at least in put patients far apart from one another, uh, make sure that staff are protected uh, as much as possible with the resources available. Um, and the other thing is that what I have seen in here is, you know, the entire floor in my hospital, what they did is they just, you know, opened the, 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 uh, uh, the, the walls, the make a hole, and then they connected with the AC tubing system and they put a little machine that sucks air out of the room and, you know, dispose the air outside. That's how they're creating negative pressure rooms. I don't know if something uh, like that can be done at least to minimize aerosols but it can be, you know, obviously everything that's being done here cannot be done there, but try to be creative and at least, you know, create a distance between these patients and try to protect staff is the best that can be done at this point. So Daud, I know you are the big advocate for this uh, infection control and negative pressure. And uh, do you know in, in at uh, Black Line Hospital if there are any rooms that are or Dr. Wondos and Amonia can also comment on this. Are there any rooms that are negative pressure? No, we don't. Sure. Dr. Wondos, go ahead. We don't have. That's one of our fear because, you know, the rooms now which we prepared for taking care of these patients, the ventilation is really awful. So what we are trying to do is open the windows. And I know how much that... Uh, and we are discussing with also with the engineers uh, if they can assist us fixing you know something with AC and so on. But now the rooms which are prepared for taking care of these patients are not, uh, and, and this would create a problem, I suppose. Yeah. So, so in uh, the A's floor, at, at least at Black Eye Hospital, there are rooms that were meant for negative pressure. By the way, the way how they were built. Uh, they have the ante room, which is a place where you change your clothes and then you go inside. So I think this is a good opportunity for us, for anyone uh, to start thinking about how to build with your engineers uh, to make, to create a negative pressure rooms. But I'm, I know that in this emergency time for many of the hospitals, it's not a possible thing. So the, the, the smallest thing that I would recommend is really for a leadership to divert patients to other places and those places where there are ventilators at least at a minimum uh, every single ventilator has to be in one single room uh, i mean we have to protect healthcare professionals and uh, nosocomial transmission of uh, covid infection uh, so i mean at that time i'm sure um, i mean routine surgeries are going to stop i mean routine things are going to stop if if this influx comes in so at least this is the time to start thinking how, which are the rooms, the ideal rooms for patients on ventilator. So the places where there are an ante room, meaning the place where you change clothes before you get inside the room, those would be, those would be the ones that I would prefer to put ventilators on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, Dr. Mola, there are a few questions that are around the ethics of you know, the patient that is having, say, cardiopulmonary arrest or somehow dying and resuscitation. So, so I think some of the questions, if I can put them together, um, suggest, you know, are there any guidelines you guys use for the DNR status? You know, is everybody do not resuscitate or are there some that are resuscitated? How is that? Can you just elaborate a little bit and also 
you know, tell us if there is any specific guidelines you, you do and how you approach it from the beginning with the patient coming in. Thank you. Uh, before we move to this question, I would like to add just a little bit to the previous question. Uh, good good uh, uh, hearing from uh, uh, Dawit and Dr. Wenderson. So, again, as I said, the minimum that can be done is please keep distance among patients. Uh, you know, in a normal situation, I saw a lot of people working up there. What we do right now is uh, in, the, in the COVID floors, we have designated COVID floors right now. We limit just one physician as much as possible and then only uh, few nurses, few respiratory therapists, limit movement, make sure that all these people are done appropriately and put these patients far apart, as far apart as possible from one another. Uh, that, that's the best that can be done with the setting uh, uh, that's available. Uh, unless, you know, some other uh, mechanisms are built and then we can isolate patients and put them in different rooms. Uh, the second question, again, even in here, there are different state and national laws um, about uh, the resuscitation. Uh, <clears throat> but again, uh, when patients get into that status, uh, there is discussion at my institution, for example, to, to try to go around these rules and try not to resuscitate these patients because it's a very, very big ethical uh, dilemma. So it's right now because it's hard to, uh, uh, you know, experts are discussing, uh, you know, experts are discussing at national level, even in the United States, uh, to try not to resuscitate these patients. But there are also uh, very, you know, strong laws uh, to, to make this a rule. But right now we're uh, discussing with patients, make them do not resuscitate after discussion and then try to resuscitate only very young patients who otherwise are healthy and have a good chance. And then when we do resuscitate them, always we take priority for staff. You know, we make sure that even if someone is arresting, we make sure that everybody is appropriately donned before you know, running into the room to try to do CPR on these patients. Make sure that what we are doing right now is if those patients are not intubated, make sure that airway is secured before. Because when you do CPR, there will be massive aerosolization. So, even if the patients are resting, we secure their way really quickly before we start chest compression. So we're trying to go around and have a plan like this, but in an in in Ethiopian situation, where even after cardio resuscitation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, um, you know, like the things that we do in here are not very uh, widely available, uh, the chance of survival would be limited. So understanding that, I think. Uh, discussing at national level there and try to go into a situation where where um, patients were sick and dying from this should not be resuscitated, I think is a very, very reasonable thing to do. It's being considered very seriously here in the United States as well. So anything, uh, Elias, you want to add? Because I know you probably have to resuscitate and is there any guidelines you're following in terms of uh, who to resuscitate if they have a cardiac arrest? And while you are there, can you guys also comment on the chloroquine and uh, hydroxychloroquine related QT prolongation? How often do you see it? And uh, that's also one of the questions that's out there. Okay. Salam, uh, So, uh, so uh, this is Elias. Uh, no, so this cardio pulmonary cessation topic is uh, the most difficult one. I don't, and uh, everybody's struggling. So, uh, it, it would be interesting to hear the Ethiopian perspective, actually, from either Dr. Wanderson or Dr. Tudros. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, so our, uh, what we're doing is uh, we are actually preparing a, a policy by the uh, ethical ethics department. Um, so it's multidisciplinary. So the short answer is no, we don't have any policy yet. Uh, so about QT prolongation, so hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, uh, we do have a, a, a lot of experience because both of them are used in a SLE and rheumatoid arthritis. So there are a lot of data on QT prolongation, including malignant arrhythmia. So, and uh, azithromycin also has a tendency to prolong QT. So uh, personally, I have not seen any arrhythmia, but we do follow uh, EKG uh, every other day. Uh, when they are on this two medication, and it's a five-day course, so it's, it's essentially on admission, on a, a and uh, and probably one or two should should be enough. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a well known and uh, described side effect of uh, uh, especially hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine and, uh, and azithromycin. So the answer is yes. It's also important to understand that when you combine these patients that are given treatment for pneumonia with macrolides and quinolones and other potentially other QT prolonging drugs, when you combine hydroxychloroquine with these other medications, when it's one, it can, it, it can be tolerated fairly well, but you need to continue to uh, you know, watch the uh, QTC. But if the patient's taking other medications too, it becomes even riskier. So make sure that you review the patient's medications and 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 uh, um, and, uh, and make sure that all other medications are discontinued as much as possible. I have I had to stop hydroxychloroquine at least on three patients because QTC went above 530 and stuff like that. So it's real. I have seen it and it's well described. And patients kind of cardiomyopathy and arrhythmia from that. And if you put them on hydroxychloroquine, they can go into fetal arrhythmia. So you need to keep an eye on this. Uh, hi, just to add a few things, you know, uh, from my, <clears throat> uh, this is Dr. Zerihun, by the way, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I uh, would like to say things about the infection control and uh, uh, preventing the health workers from, you know, uh, being contaminated. So some of the things we did here, one, uh, for example, we, we have gotten all the IV uh, apparatus outside the room. So that the nurses doesn't have to go into the room and they can, uh, you know, push the medication outside. You know, uh, the second thing we have done is, you know, we batch uh, orders so the nurses don't need to go back and forth to do things. So everything will be thought about very well and put together in one time. And then, you know, they go one, they do whatever they need to do, and they go out. So they don't need, you know, to go back and forth about, you know, similar to the other patients. Uh, another uh, thing which uh, is helping us actually is a uh, even installed uh, uh, you know uh, computer in my home, and I can see every one of the rooms with the camera. So I don't know if there is a simple camera system where it can be installed in the patient's room, and you know patients can be seen by that, and you know uh, you, you know you don't need to go into the room every day, or you know you can just follow uh, them. Uh, by that, uh, so that can decrease, you know, uh, you know, contamination. Uh, uh, another thing is, you know, I think, you know, pre-planning. For example, intubation has to be really pre-planned, you know, well thought, you know, what are the things needed, so that uh, this needs a good written protocol, uh, so that we will be complete and we don't need to come out back and forth, you know, once we go uh, into uh, the room. So, you know, I think these are uh, the, about the infection and, you know, regarding the, uh, the DNR status, you know, what we are doing here is, you know, we have a committee, uh, including ethics, you know, a lot of, you know, organization lawyers and so on included in it. So, uh, and when things are not looking good, you know, we actively start talking to the family and it's not the physician response, it's the hospital as a body who talks to the, the family and, you know, I think, you know, some of them, they give them really uh, a straight, you know, uh, DNR. In Ethiopian situation, I think do, doing uh, DNR is, you know, for me, it is, uh, it is inappropriate. It's just going to expose people because these people, when they get that sick, really they are unrecoverable. But the risk of, you know, disseminating this thing is uh, good. So, now, my, my thoughts for this is, you know, giving some kind of general recommendation uh, and keeping the resources, you know, available for others. Thanks. Uh, Gurma, can we hear from uh, Dr. Tedros and Dr. Wendosen about their uh, perspective on this issue? Yeah, yeah. So, can please, you yes, yeah, good point. Probably in Ethiopia, it has to be yeah. a viable yeah. option. Actually, we don't, we don't have a policy, but uh, don't forget that we are working in a very resource-constrained setting. So for such kind of patients, you know, decisions are often made on subjective basis. However, for patients with really poor outcome, we don't do vigorous, uh, you know, resuscitative attempts for a number of reasons. So, so I think the bottom line is, you know, here, I think this discussion will help maybe guide a little bit for every institution, 
to kind of uh, come up with some guideline as to how they do this. But there is a question about, you know, how early is early intubation? And also a question about, is there a group who decides about who gets intubated or not intubated? Or is it a purely medical decision? Uh, how and who should be intubated kind of a question in this high risk patients that may end up dying. So can you guys, you know, Mola, can you start commenting on that? Yes, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, individualized to every patient situation. But generally, when we admit patients with acute respiratory failure in a normal world, you can, you know, try to watch them very closely, even if they're requiring more and more, put them on high flow nasal cannula. Um, for respiratory failure, if the patients have obstructive lung disease or heart failure, you can try an invasive ventilation while watching them. Um, uh, but in this situation, again, those kind of procedures are risky and can be uh, due to aerosolization, as I said earlier. So generally, the general recommendation is, uh, number one, uh, avoid delaying uh, intubation if the patients are progressing in the wrong direction for a number of reasons. Number one, try not to aerosolize. Number two, when you intubate, try to intubate them early, uh, as stable as they are, because uh, they can tolerate uh, induction and paralysis without significant uh, events during intubation. Uh, in a normal world, you know, if something like that happens, you can bag them, you can, uh, they can be coughing and stuff like that. You don't want these patients to cough. You don't want these patients to, to be unstable, requiring a lot of you know, drama during intubation. So the idea is if the patient has been progressing and they're getting to six, eight, 10 liters of nasal cannula, or they're becoming more and more tachypneic. So try to intubate them early so that they can tolerate the procedure uh, fairly well uh, and, <clears throat> and avoid uh, other kind of support that we normally do uh, in, in the non-COVID uh, situation, like as I said, non invasive potentially aerosolizing procedures. So when we intubate, what we do is give them a higher amount of oxygen through the nasal cannula, try to pre-oxygenate them, then do rapid sequence intubation, give them a sedation induction, then paralytic medicine if possible, so that they don't cough at all. So they stop breathing, they stop coughing, and with the best available expertise, uh, we use video laryngoscope. That's a discussion whether it's more successful than direct direct laryngoscopy, but we use video in most situations. So that in the first attempt without suctioning, without bagging, without applying any invasive ventilation, you put the airway and right away connect the vent to the ventilator so that it's a closed system. So the overall idea is, uh, you know, intubate these patients earlier than usual without doing those, those procedures to minimize the aerosolization risk to staff. Rahel, I know you are also on the call and uh... And uh, could you say any few words on uh, the intubation piece? What is early for you? And um, what are the triggers in terms of uh, clinical decision? Hi, yeah, so early for us, I, I rely on the lab values and what and the intensivists. So usually what will happen is they will they'll call anesthesia to come or to, to intubate. Um, they're asking for the most experienced people. And so at our institution, it's the anesthesia team members. Um, and when I am going there, um, our, I'd say at our institution, we wait a little bit um, because when, by the time we're there, the patients do look a little bit more labored with their breathing. Um, and I think every institution, and I want to tell this, I'd say everybody, we are still learning a lot about this, so things change. Um, something that we do now today may be different than what we do in two days um, based on what's going on. But when we go in there, um, patients are usually pretty uh, tachypneic and they do look labored in their breathing. And the intensivists tell me they're using their ratio um, PAO2 to the FIO2 um, and using that to determine. So, but everything that Mole said is correct with the making sure that it's in a controlled way. Um, the nice thing about doing an intubation is our medicines, our induction agents will make that patient, um, you know, uh, more comfortable. And then the, the uh, paralytic sedates them completely and, and, and paralyzes them. So we can do it in a nice controlled way where we do diminish aerosolization. Um, I wanted to also just quickly talk about the CPR if that's okay. Um, 
the CPR, I know is something culturally going to be very difficult for, um, for certain countries. Um, and even here it is. I remember when, we, when I was being told that, you know, hey, the CPR does not result in a good outcome. The patients, once they are, once we have to do CPR, um, it's very, very rarely successful. And instead what it's doing is exposing um, all the healthcare workers that are in there doing CPR. So our policies are um, almost nobody gets CPR with chest compressions. We can do medical uh, CPR, like, you know, of course, giving the pressors and things like that, medical management or IV medicine management, but we are not doing chest compressions. And um, it is very clear and understood that only a certain, it's like three, three to four people would be in the room and we don't enter um, the area, even if the patient is actually, um, you know, really does need us all to run in there like we normally would, we stop and we have to put all of our PPE on. So it's, it's really serious, and I just wanted to make sure I, I really convey that um, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not, I guess, what physicians ever really thought we'd end up doing, but it is the case. It is what we are doing now. We are trying our hardest to avoid doing chest compressions and realizing that CPR is not truly very life-saving in this situation. Thank you. Yes, Dan. Just to mention, uh, to take it into Ethiopian context, uh, I mean, at most, a hospital is going to have five to ten ventilators. Um, and uh, we're seeing from uh, more or less uh, data also that the outcome from ventilators is not very good to start with. Uh, and uh, to add for a minimal increment into CPR, I think Dr. Wendelson and Dr. Uh, Tedros uh, and other teams will start continue this communication offline. But I challenge you to come up with a, with a plan. I think our effort has to be mostly on avoiding intubation to the pre-intubation time where oxygen uh, supplement can be done with a non rib reserve or things like that. But once somebody is intubated, I think the priority has to be given on how to protect healthcare professionals because this, from all the things that we are discussing right now, it's a very high risk procedure for medical professionals to intubate the process itself, to maintain those patients on intubation on a daily basis, there is an incremental risk for medical professionals uh, with a very limited, meager incremental uh, benefit. So I think for the Ethiopian context, a black and white rules are very critically needed, like, for example, resuscitation, uh, like, for example, because once you have 10 ventilators and they are hooked to 10 patients, the average time is 10 days. You see, they're, they're locked for 10 days each. For 10 days, you cannot intubate anymore, even if you're the young, healthy person. So, so, I mean, if somebody is not going to make it, adding another process a day or two uh, by just resuscitating, I don't think will uh, be to the benefit of uh, at a society level. So I think we should come up with a very good rule. Yeah, so this is the point, right? So the point is really to share these experiences so that um, the solutions are going to be always local. And I think, um, you know, there are individuals locally who can really take all this information, distill it and, and make it something that they own. And so I hope that's where we are going to land. And one important point Dr. Rael actually mentioned is, uh, she mentioned that as an anesthesia team, they are, for example, probably the strike team for airway management. So meaning these teams, it's all about preparation. For example, in my hospital here, we have a team that is going to be responsible for central IV access. So that team will be called whenever there is a central line. Need. And uh, it, it is not the direct responsibility of the ICU physician to do that. There is a, a what we call a strike team also for airway management, the same way. There's a group of physicians. It's not necessarily only anesthesiologists, but there is also intensivist in, the, in that team who are just dedicated for the airway management. So as Dr. Rahel said, they are actually the best. They are gonna do it well, do it right. And so there is what we call this additional strike teams that have been organized in this. So, so it is really all about planning. It's all about teams and it's all about everybody being um, knowledgeable uh, about the disease process. And it's gonna require everybody to work in a very coordinated manner. So, um, so that said, there were 
you know, a few more questions, and we have a few more minutes left, um, which I think are, is important. Um, one is about vasopressors. Is there any vasopressor of choice, things that need to be avoided if you need to do some cardiopulmonary supportive medications? And then, um, and, and, uh, and then, you know, in the same line, let me see, if there are arrhythmias or others, uh, how do you treat them? How do you deal with them? So just staying a little bit on the cardiac aspect of things. You know, vasopressor of choice is there one. Uh, if arrhythmias arise, how do you deal with those? So <clears throat> when it comes to vasopressors, uh, as I said earlier, management of these patients in ICU is mostly supportive and it follows the routine care of uh, patients with the ARDS. If the patients develop uh, uh, hemodynamic instability, uh, hypotension, we uh, we use usual vasopressors the, the for um, shock patients, septic shock patients. Uh, <clears throat> generally, the uh, first line treatment here is norepinephrine or it's called levofed as well. And then, if the second line agent is either epinephrine or or vasopressin. Uh, when I was there in Ethiopia two years ago, uh, dopamine was the only available agent. So dopamine has a, a lot of beta-1 activity, as uh, most of you, all of you know. So patients who are tachycardic already, it may not be the best choice. Uh, but again, we use whatever is available. So just whatever is available for written care of uh, shock patients, um, um, is good. If possible, again, usually the first choice will be norepinephrine for these patients. Uh, coming to patients who are developing arrhythmia, what can be done? So <clears throat> what I have seen in my experience uh, with a uh, few patients that, that have died is they, they would have been on ventilatory support for a few days and they would start to be um, uh, arrhythmic, uh, profound shock that develops fairly rapidly. Usually we support with uh, shocks, uh, uh, vasopressor medications. Uh, if there was QT prolongations or other arrhythmogenic agents, for example, if uh, the patient was on epinephrine infusion, then we get rid of that. We obviously stop um, hydroxychloroquine if there was QTC prolongation. In those patients that had to stop hydroxychloroquine, the QTC tends to uh, return to normal within 24 hours. So what you need to do is obviously stop the offending agent first and then continue with usual supportive care. Thank you. And so, so uh, Dr. David asks, uh, how about chloroquine as a prophylaxis for the healthcare workers? What are your thoughts, guys? Uh, I would probably uh, ask Dr. Uh, Daud Siraj to, to say something on this. Uh, but as far as I know, <laughs> and as far as my reading is concerned, it, it, at this point, again, we're learning every day. Uh, again, also understand, bear in mind that these medications are not magical. You know, there is only limited uh, data that m these medications may be helpful. They're not you know, game changers. So even for treatment purposes, we're not seeing much benefit. So they may help, but we don't know for sure. And when it comes to prophylaxis, uh, I don't think there is any recommendation, but you know we're trying these medications to see if there is an effect. So uh, I, I don't know what to say. I just okay. I can say at this point there is no routine recommendation. Are they would they be helpful or not? I have no idea. I don't know. So so Daoud, any any thoughts about uh, prophylactic chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine? So this is a, a very contentious uh, issue, especially in uh, the setting of Ethiopia. You don't want to do a blank recommendation, but this has to be looked at very seriously, especially for medical professionals who have been exposed in the line of duty. It is not because there is a lot of data. I don't have any data. I mean, it's uh, because of the lack of uh, other alternate interventions. We don't have a good intervention. And when you don't have that, you try everything possible. And the thing that makes uh, chloroquine uh, very sensible is because uh, this is a medication that we know very well. So we know the side effects, we can manage it. Um, so we have been giving it. Uh, so Ethiopia actually, from what I heard, have secured um, a significant amount of chloroquine uh, dose. Uh, so they're uh, 
controlling them right now. So I think it is uh, to the um, interest of Dr. Wendwasen and Dr. Uh, Tedros to make sure that uh, we discuss with the Ministry of Health as to what would be the right and appropriate way of using those limited chloroquine uh, doses available. But in terms of data, as you know, everybody knows the data. There is no clear uh, evidence to suggest that prophylaxis helps. And if, if at all, uh, there is also another question. Is it prophylaxis throughout the season for uh, COVID or it is just post-exposure prophylaxis and for how long and all those issues? Yeah, great. So I know Dr. Mola is on working and he may leave in a minute or so. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this, um, there are a lot of questions about PPEs and uh, what we will do is maybe find another volunteer presenter to talk about PPEs and what they are and all the, you know, all what uh, we need to kind of learn about and maybe uh, put it also in the context of Ethiopia to, to figure out what we may need. So maybe we will look for uh, a PPE lecture uh, at some point uh, next year and we may uh, next week and we may add it to to one last question is I know Dr. Elias has mentioned about steroids and this has also been brought up by many of the attendees here. Um, you know, we have said no steroid as such for treating this ARDS or this, you know, uh, lung issue related as it relates to COVID. But my understanding yesterday was you can use steroids if there are other underlying problems. Is that right? It's not like steroids are contraindicated, but if they are indicated for some other reason, you should use them. Is that how it's practiced? So can I say a word on this? Yes, please. Yeah. <clears throat> steroids, <laughs> as in most situations, are controversial. Even the data that for routine care of ARDS patients is, has always been contentious. There is no strong recommendation for steroids. You know, we use it when, when other things are not working for the most part. So we're not using it steroids. So there are some data that was published in critical care medicine that may, you know, more recently that we are leaning to use it more often than before. But in this situation, it may have, uh, it may, uh, it may be more dangerous than 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 any benefit. Uh, again, we're learning every day, uh, but we have not seen any clear recommendation so far to use steroids. And actually, the recommendation is leaning towards not using for COVID patients. Now, the the question what we're dealing with in here is that what if the patient has COPD? Again, these patients are patients with chronic uh, lung disease are prone to are more susceptible to this infection and more susceptible to getting hospitalized on the ventilator and stuff like that. So if they're wheezy, look like they have uh, some sort of COPD exacerbation and also they can turn back you know, COVID positive. So what we do in here is the lab test has been taking 24, 48 hours, even longer in the previous days, it's getting shorter and shorter. So as we wait for COVID results, we did not give them any steroids. Um, but once COVID resulting is negative, then we use steroids routinely for COPD patients. Um, but if the patient is COVID positive and still having some uh, you know, COPD symptoms, we tend to use inhalers and stuff like that. And we tend to select case by case basis. So generally routine use of steroids for these patients as we stand is not recommended. If okay. you have any strong reason like adrenal insufficiency or severe COPD exacerbation, and it has to be left to uh, clinician's discretion. But uh, I lean towards not using it unless it's absolutely necessary. That's wonderful, Dr. Mola. And I know they are really calling for you, and I, I really thank you. And uh, is Dr. Zeryun still online? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so Mola, you are excused, so please go back to your patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah, take care. And so, you know, Dr. Zayun, there are some questions about about ECMO uh, in this um, patient population. And uh, if um, you know, if you can comment on on that, have you guys used ECMO? Is that something that is really needed at this point? That might become our last question. So, yeah, I think we have used ECMO uh, for these patients and. Really, you know, at that stage, uh, again, uh, we haven't seen much of the benefit uh, 
probably you know uh, more the agony for the family and everyone. So uh, I think you know just the, you know being intubated and on a ventilator, you know the mortality uh, from so far we have seen is you know. Uh, most of them are in Chinese, for example, is uh, about 60-70%. In the Italy, uh, for example, the study uh, uh, Dr. Mola mentioned, you know, in uh, JAMA, you know, it's, uh, on 50 percent of the patients are still in the ICU, and you know, the 26 percent is from the ones uh, who left the ICU. So, you know, basically about 50 percent mortality. It's already high, so ECMO probably would add very little. Uh, on that, so but we do have patients uh, on ECMO from uh, COVID. So I think the thing we are trying is, you know, if we do them, we do them very early uh, before, you know, a severe hypoxemia or severe cardio, you know, vascular collapse, uh, you know, uh, happens. Um, so you know, saying that, I think on the steroid, you know, one comment I would like to make uh, is, uh, you know, I think this disease is very, very um, you know, very unique and very fascinating, you know, the pathophysiologic mechanism and everything. We are learning a lot, but, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, these patients, you know, the way uh, they present clinically uh, is due to several factors, but one of them is the host response. Uh, so, you know, some of the patients, as I said, they will be like silent hypoxemia. Some of them, uh, they will have, you know, a high work of breathing, and some of them, they come really febrile, having a very high CPRP, very high interleukin, uh, and, you know, usually, you know, then they will get better, then the second phase will come, and again, they get ragey, ragey. So, you know, these kinds of patients are, um, uh, are being damaged by their own host response, so especially young people and you know, some patients also for unknown reason, probably genetic. So, you know, it's for those patients, for example, we are using interleukin-6 blockers. Uh, and, you know, for some, we have used steroid. And, you know, uh, it's very early for us to say that we have seen improvements. But, you know, we kind of select those treatments for patients who manifest, uh, you know, with a very uh, a hyper-inflammatory or hyper-metabolic state. Um, so, uh, yep. Thank you. Sorry. I think uh, we have really uh, covered a lot of stuff um, today, and um, the next two days we are going to talk about ventilator management. So I think some of these issues are going to be revisited again. Clearly, we have uh, a moving target in terms of medications and treatments, and if there are any new updates, new um, literature output that comes through. Uh, We'll certainly make sure everybody gets updated. I'm looking forward into next week where we'll also touch in um, about maternal and child related things because there will be pregnant women coming to your hospitals and uh, you know, suspect of having or, you know, uh, the disease or you know, at risk of being exposed. So we have uh, a neonatologist who's gonna be talking about that. We want to also include towards the end a discussion around around what you know what the leadership should do and how the team should function and so just kind of uh, putting it all together kind of thing from leadership perspective by Dr. Dowds, right? So that it can really help you guys, um, you know, think about your local context and uh, organize your structures in such a way that's going to be less taxing. And, and definitely we'll look into a detailed discussion about PPE, what are they and um, you know, all the different kinds and, and how they are used and how they are put on and off and uh, the different names and the different applications. So stay tuned to, for that. Um, and I really are uh, very appreciative about our um, presenters and discussants. And you know, I really thank everyone from the Ethiopian side